Hey there kids, it's me. <laughs> it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and this is like take six. So, <laughs> I know that you guys are usually interested in those stories like, Hey, I was a police officer from a mysterious town. Or, hey, I really enjoyed my time as a firefighter, but something strange happened. There's actually a book that I really want to talk to you guys specifically about. And it's called Sirens at Midnight, Terrifying Tales of First Responders. This is a book featuring authors that you all recognize, like Nick Bodick and Kyle Harrison, Scott Savino. These are all authors that I've like had on my channel a whole bunch. And they're all about um, first responders type stories. So if you guys have been into that, check out this book. This book is only $4.99 for digital. And the link for it is in the description down below. That's all for today, folks. On to tonight's story. Well, I can honestly say I never thought I'd be writing one of these. If I do a good job telling the story, you can blame it on my pal Andy. He's the one who put me up to this. So I guess... Uh, well, I guess I need a little backstory. My name's Ethan. Ethan Hart. I'm 32 years old. Divorced father of three. A volunteer firefighter here in North Haven County. If you don't know where that is, uh, take out a map of Penn State. Close your eyes near the top, Potter County, and then toss a dart to the east area. You probably found us. In other words, we're nothing special here. I live on the south side of the county in Dewsbury, a scenic little town where everybody knows everybody. You get to decide if it's a good thing or not. Anyway, the VFD services the whole county because the population what ain't but like 3,000 at the most. Although I think recently we've had to ask for a little assistance here and there from close by counties to handle brush fires in the hot season. On a typical day, though, there's normally about three, four guys at the firehouse, and then the rest of us are all on call. The day this particular call came in, I was actually supposed to take Brandon, my oldest, fishing over in uh, Lake Virtus. Ryan, our fire chief, knows that when any of the other guys call in sick, that I'll pick up the slack if needed. Well, for Paxton Heights, I wish I'd never answered the phone. I didn't actually know what we were heading into downtown Williamsport. I didn't actually know that we were headed to downtown Williamsport until I got to the firehouse. Everyone else was loading up engine three to roll out. Fucking business committee needs to just shut the electricity off in the damn place if you ask me, Andy said as he grabbed his coat and got in the back of the truck. Yeah... I knew exactly what he meant just from the remark alone. The place was a beat-down, crummy hot spot for homeless junkies and gangs, smack dab in the middle of town by the riverbed. It's five stories tall, and honestly, it's seen more electrical fires in three years than most of us can count. I think the only reason that it's even still standing is thanks to the brick and mortar and the foundation of the place. I figured this would be another routine call, but well... Yeah, I guess I'm jumping the gun, huh? Sorry, like I said, I just don't know how to get these thoughts out here fluidly, because it's so crazy. When we got there, I could tell immediately the fire had probably been raging for about an hour. This wasn't going to be a quick fix like the last one. Sam parked the truck on the east side of the road, and Andy took the ladder as the rest of us started putting up road barriers. Two passing motorists were stopping to get a gander or a snapshot at the fire, so I made it my job to try and keep them in from getting too close. Jerry grabbed the hose to get into the fire hydrant at the street corner as I glanced up above and saw Andy get into the third story window. Now that was that was where the majority of the smoke was coming from. So it made sense to see if we could if we could call the fire near the source first. Engine three, what's your 20? I heard Rick ask across our two-way. Here at the heat, Sam shouted back. I got a couple of calls from the neighboring buildings. Say they saw a few kids wandering near the old lobby. Might want to check it out. Ryan bellowed back. Art, you up? Sam yelled. Jerry waved for me to go inside while he took point with the hose and crowd. The entrance to the apartment was literally a dumpster diver's paradise. And an inferno waiting to happen. If the blaze decided to travel down here, I said a prayer like I always do. And went head deep into hell. I pushed open the wide doors and looked around the lobby trying to gauge the area. Art to base. I'm on floor one. Negative on any stragglers. I said to my radio as I started checking the nearby lounges. 
There wasn't anything at first. As I stood there in the lounge looking at the vending machines, I did notice what appeared to be a long trail of smoke seeping out of the floor near the, the outlets. As I raised my flashlight to get a better look, he'd call me crazy, but it seemed... It seemed like it moved when the light got close. I stood there for another minute, staring at it, when I got a call from Andy that jolted me back to reality. I got structural damage on three, and I sent two girls trying to make it to the south stairs. I'm gonna have to get out or it'll give way. Roger that, I'll find a way up, as I said as I raced towards the main lobby again. I could feel the heat starting to push down from the second floor, like a wave battering ashore that I wondered how long it would be before this place was done. Hart, you got two minutes that I want you out of there! Ryan. I knew he was just going by the book, but but I wasn't about to let two kids burn to death on my watch. The door near the south stairs was bolted. I took out my axe, started bashing against the thing. I kept hearing this jarring, strange noise from above like an echo. Figured it must have been the girls. I ignored any chatter on the radio as I smashed the door to pieces and began to climb. Part of the stairs was already collapsed just from age. I heard the whispers again. Stay where you are, I shouted. I used every bit of my strength to climb over the collapsed stairs as the noises got louder. It sounded like the shuffling of feet. I kept going. The fire would be there in less than a minute, and I knew I had to save those kids. I stopped near the next step and saw one girl just huddled behind a stack of old boards, trying to keep from the blaze. I'm gonna get you out of here, I told her. I extended my hand, and the timid girl grabbed it as we began to move back towards the stairs. Going down wasn't an option later, as several piles of debris fell from above and the girl clung to me. She squealed and shivered as we moved to the second floor, and I frantically searched for an exit. Engine three! I got one I need to get out! Get the ladder near the west side of the building! I shouted at my partners. The fire was everywhere here, crossing the old walkway like a, like a relentless wave of death. I kept the kid behind me. She barely had any clothes on, or even shoes. Even getting out was going to be nothing but a pain for her. Then I heard another sound from the next hallway, and we moved together to investigate. The second girl was pinned under a collapsed beam, and I gave out several quick orders to the first. Move over there! Stay near the window! My partners are coming to get you! I knelt down to check for any immediate injuries, and then pushed the beam off slowly, turning her over. She was coughing, and I swear, it seemed like smoke was coming out of her mouth. I looked up towards the doorway where I had first told the girl to stay, but she was gone. The second girl grabbed at me, and I found myself mesmerized by her eyes. Smoke was moving under her irises and out of her mouth as she tried to talk. I saw Andy coming in through the doorway. Hart! Hart! What the hell are you doing? Let's go! I turned to tell the girl we needed to move, only to see that I was staring at an empty floor. Only smoke seemed to remain where she once had been. Suddenly, above me, another beam collapsed. It hit my ribs as it came down on me, and I heard Andy shout a few cuss words. The fire was growing larger now, pinning us down in the hallway. Did you see them? Where did you go? I asked frantically as Andy tugged at me towards the window. Get a grip, Hart! You have to get out of here! I looked down the hallway, watching as two small bodies danced in the smoke. I felt a rough blow to my head as he tried to push through the rising blaze, and when I came to... I was in the Mother Bella County Clinic with a few stitches and bruises and a very angry fire chief glaring down at me. Hart, I could have taken you off duty for the stunt you pulled today. I didn't bother explaining what had happened. I found out a little later as I watched the news that Rosedale's company came to help us. Managed to get the blaze under control by four that afternoon. Andy came by an hour later and gave me a piece of his mind. The hell happened in there? Look, I was... I was just trying to save those kids. What kids? What are you talking about? There were twin girls on floor two, right before the big collapse. I had one of them near me. Andy shook his head. Hart, you were alone. Wasn't nobody there. No bodies were pulled. I frowned in confusion as he told me that. Ryan gave me a few days off to clear my head. Last thing that I really need right now, but I insisted to Andy that I saw them. You must have gotten out on their own, my buddy told me as he shook his head in disgust. I flipped the channels trying not to let it get to me about the girls. Then I paused. I saw another update about the fire. That's them! That's them! Right there! I said pointing to the photos. The ones that the news crew were showing. 
Andy grabbed the remote and turned up the volume. Appears that the fire started near apartment 330, which of course has given rise to new speculation about the Covington murders, the broadcaster said. Shit. What? What, what is it? Those are the kids? Definitely. Dude. They died five years ago. I froze and looked at the pictures. They were locked in the place. Burned alive. I really think... I'm going to need more than five days to clear my head. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thanks for listening to tonight's story. I really want to encourage you guys to take a look at the description, which I know that's not something you guys do on YouTube or on podcasts, but hear me out, okay? In the description of every single video that I've ever done, there's always going to be a link over to where you can find more from the author of the story. And I'm suggesting that you guys check them out because, let's be honest, without the authors, there are no creepypasta stories. I mean, yeah, I'm pretty sure I could be on here and tell you guys the cookie dough recipe off the back of a Chips Ahoy, but that's not going to be nearly as interesting. So seriously, if you guys are listening here on YouTube, or if you're listening on Spotify, or iTunes, or Google Play, then take a look. I also want to give a great big thank you to Andrew Steinberg, Andrea Solvik, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Champinsky, Melissa Siegwert, Cindy Barney, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Gabrielle DeBaca, Asia, Tyler Ramberg, Nicholas Saeed Elyasen, Brianne Ventine Jensen, Ken Lando Higuchi, Eric Mary, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, and Wayne Milestead. These guys are the big boys over on patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, which you can always go to if you'd like to help support me and the show. That's it for tonight, guys, and sweet dreams. <laughs>